Hi everyone, uh, my name is Karen Lynch and I'm here today with my partner Christian Brylowski and we're from your friendly neighborhood bookstore, the Big Navy Bookshop across the way. Um, we would like to welcome all of you to today's event. Thank you so much for coming inside on such a beautiful summer day. Um, I know there are lots of things going on in town today, so we're, we're really thankful that you came and to spend some time with us. Um, we also want to be sure to thank both the Norman Williams Public Library for hosting in their beautiful mezzanine, um, and the Woodstock Inn for their kindness and generosity in hosting our visiting author, and for the reception that they're giving after this, which we hope you can all join us for um, over in the Woodstock Inn in front of the Rockefeller Room. And uh, you know, we're just we're really excited to be able to partner with local organizations like these because um, it makes it really easy to, to bring new and varied voices to the Woodstock area. So thank you to everybody. And finally, thank you to Julia Cook, who can't be here uh, right now because she's having her baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but her work behind the scenes is truly what brought today's event into being. And we are so very fortunate to have her here as a part of the community. So big thanks to her and good luck to her as well. Um, and since I'm from the bookstore, a quick reminder uh, that we will have copies of today's book on sale over at the reception afterwards. Um, and as always, whenever we partner with the library, a portion of the sales will go directly to the library. Um, and we want to thank you for uh, supporting the literary organizations in your town. And now I'll tell you a little bit about our presenting author. Zinzi Clemens was raised in Philadelphia by a South African mother and an American father. Her debut novel, What We Lose, was named Debut Novel of the Year by Vogue and received praise from The Atlantic, The Guardian, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and a long list of other newspapers and magazines. What We Lose was a finalist for the Aspen Words Literary Prize, the California Book Award, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and the National Book Critics Circle Leonard Prize. It was long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal, Medal for Excellence in Fiction, the Brooklyn Public Library Literary Prize, and the International Dublin Literary Award. She is a 2017 National Book Award 535 honoree. Her essays and thoughtful book reviews have been published in the New York Times Book Review and the Los Angeles Review of Books. As various reviewers noted from the loosely autobiographical what we use, its form is as important and innovative as its content. In it, Zinzi mixes hand-drawn charts, archival photographs, blog posts, song lyrics, and commentary on such current topics as Oscar Pistorius and the Mandela's. Through, through a plot that centers on the narrator's loss of her difficult and loving mother to cancer and her own journey toward and through motherhood, Zinzi twines together what one reviewer called Singular Meditations on Racism's Brutal Intimacies. <coughs> Throughout what we use, the prose demonstrates a keen sensitivity to how emotions, love, pain, devotion, fear, ambivalence, thread through actions large and small, political and intimate. Personally, I am in awe of how Zinzi managed to create a compulsively readable book that propels a reader forward through vignettes that are read out of chronological order and that are equally easy to read and profound. While reading it, I was fully immersed in the world of the book itself. Afterwards, I found myself marveling at the technical feat of how she constructed that world in such a rigorously interesting form. What we lose is a tear-through read, and we're very lucky to have Zinzi here today to read from it. Please join me in welcoming Zinzi. Uh, thank you very much for that warm welcome. I, it's, very much appreciated. Um, I think it, was, it also served as a very good introduction to the book and um, uh, mentioned uh, my most important note before reading, which is that the book is composed of fragments. It is not chronological. Um, I'm going to be reading from the beginning today, but as you'll see, the narrative sort of skips back and forth in time. Um, and I try to pause at the end of each fragment um, and that will, yeah, so that you'll kind of, we'll get the idea as we go along. And then if it's too confusing, you can ask me questions at the end. Okay, let's see. Sorry, I'm a little bit. Lovely, warm summer day. Mm -hmm. 
And um, maybe I'll begin today by reading um, the epigraph. It's a couple of quotes. I want to write rage, but all that comes is sadness. We have been sad long enough to make this earth weep or grow fertile. I am an anachronism, a sport, like the bee that was never meant to fly. Science said so. I am not supposed to exist. I carry death around in my body like a condemnation. But I do live. The bee flies. There must be some way to integrate, to integrate death into living, neither ignoring it nor giving in to it. It's from Audre Lorde, The Cancer Journals. African American women now have about the same risk of getting breast cancer as white women. However, the risk of dying from breast cancer remains higher for African American women. In 2012, African American women had a 42% higher rate of breast cancer mortality than white women. That's from the Susan G. Komen organization. And as I read, just going to riff a little bit here. Um, I spent most of last night glued to the TV screen um, and reading those quotes brought to mind Kamala Harris's amazing performance. Um, and it was really touching to see her speak to an experience um, with so much power and passion as she did. Even if I don't always agree with her politics. Okay. I was born as apartheid was dying. In South Africa, fervent national pride and multiculturalism were taking hold as the new national policy. I was born in America. My mother was born in Johannesburg and my father in New York. My mother's entire family still lives within 20 minutes of each other. They are middle to upper class coloreds, mixed race, not black. Although my mom involved herself in some of the political unrest, and she proudly saved a newspaper from 1970 that has a photograph prominently featuring a handwritten sign she made. My family was quiet and generally avoided the brunt of the conflict. My father was raised in New York and went to college in Philadelphia. In the year after his graduation, he went on a trip volunteering in Botswana. My mother was there partying with some of her militant friends. Ostensibly, they were there collecting literature to distribute back home. Your mother was inescapable, my father told me. Not that she was ravishing or enchanting, but that he simply couldn't get away from her. When I went back to Philadelphia, she called me, and she called me again. When I called her back, she asked if I could come to America to live with me. My mother befriended people aggressively. She was extremely opinionated and often abrasive. I sometimes hated the rough manner in which she dealt with people. Her favorite words were four-lettered, and she liked to yell at waiters in restaurants and people in line at stores. My mother's roots were deep and strong. Her relationships with others were resilient. She had friends that friendships that persisted over decades, oceans, breakups. Her best friends were all former boyfriends. Most of her friends, and she had many, spoke of her offending them shortly after they met. One story my mother told often was when one of her best friends threatened to commit suicide after her boyfriend left her. She went to my mother for comfort, and my mother slapped her across the face as hard as she could. Her friend's face was bruised for a week. My mother used this story as an illustration of how to be a good friend. She had close bonds with the other black nurses at her job, with whom she could affect a West Philly accent to match the best of them. And she had a coterie of South African expats from our area, as well as some from Washington, D.C. and Boston, whom she sometimes invited to our house for dinner or to watch a soccer game. They called our house at all hours and begged my mother for medical advice in Afrikaans or Zulu. Their child had a fever or their mother-in-law was acting crazy again. Was it dementia or just moods? Many of them lacked green cards and insurance, and for them, my mother was the reliable center of their ad hoc community. I have never personally been a victim of violence in South Africa. I remember a neighbor who was stabbed when I was little, the neighbor knocking on my grandmother's door late at night, the enamel bowl with water turned pink and hazy that my grandmother used to wash his wounds. My mother was the victim of a smash and grab in the hills around our vacation home. The assailant broke the car window and snatched her purse from her lap. She never drove alone again. 
but most of what I experience is secondhand from my family and the news. Together, the stories and pictures constitute a, a vision of death and carnage that is overwhelming, incongruous to the plain spoken beauty of the country. I see no evidence of the horror, which is what makes it terrifying to me. This is the secret I have long held from my family. South Africa terrifies me. It always has. When I am there, I am often kept awake in bed at night, imagining which combination of failed locks, security doors, and alarms will allow a burglar inside, inviting disaster. I fear that we will be involved in one of the atrocities we learn of daily. After apartheid, crime there has been insidious and seeming, seemingly limitless. Citizens live behind locked doors, security gates, electric fencing. The more money a family has, the more advanced the, me the methods of protection. I have seen the progression of defense methods in the years I have been visiting. When I was younger, every house, if it was large enough, had a crown of barbed wire atop its high security wall. Since then, the barbed wire has been exchanged for electric fencing. Single fortifications for each property are no longer enough. Now many streets and neighborhoods are blocked off with turnstiles and patrolled 24 hours a day by hired guards. The security of my hometown in Pennsylvania was way past anything my South African family could imagine. The town was populated by stately old colonial mansions, not unlike here, most of them worth millions of dollars. When family members visited from South Africa, they would ask, where are the security fences? Our neighbor, an old widow with a stubborn streak, slept with the front door wide open through the night. Is she mad, my aunts and uncles would ask. She may have been, but in that town it barely raised an eyebrow. In winter, the houses were adorned by twinkling Christmas lights. My relatives, my relatives asked if they could take pictures on our neighbor's lawns. We spent hours driving around to find the brightest displays in neighborhoods miles away from ours. They would never have done this at home, my relatives said, because people would steal the lights. Robbers would climb up on the fences and the roofs and cut them down, then sell them on the black market for the copper wiring. In South Africa, there was little rhyme or reason to the tragedies of daily life but there was social order of an old world type and ma magnitude. I didn't respect her, my mother would often say, because I didn't speak to her like a child should. But I wasn't any ruder than my school friends who treated their parents as older companions or siblings. This type of equality was at the root of my mother's feelings of insecurity. In South Africa, elders were treated with extreme dignity that, in my eyes, bordered on the comical. My cousins never addressed their parents with pronouns face to face. Instead, even my middle-aged aunts and uncles with grown children of their own referred to my grandfather as da or daddy instead of you. Thus, a casual request turned into an awkward and foreign sounding statement as they were forced to say, can daddy please pass the salt? I could never imagine such a sentence falling from my American lips. One of my school friends called both her parents by their first names, and my mother found her so novel and strange that she actually liked her. She called this friend her favorite with heavy sarcasm. Whenever I spoke my friend's name, my mother would chuckle and shake her head as if delighted at the thought that this girl actually existed. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. I work for a public health agency in Forest Hills, Queens, a job that has systematically robbed me of my idealism since the day I started. With every day that goes by, every person who passes through our door, I banish further the possibility of anything ever truly changing for the better. I admitted this to my boss, an overweight middle-aged woman with dull red hair and three ex-husbands. She laughed at me. You're finally getting it, huh? she said, and walked away from me, cackling all the way down the hall. They sent me to a conference on HIV AIDS pharmaceuticals in Oregon. I spent four boring days floating disinterestedly from presentation to presentation to hotel bar before I noticed Peter sitting across the table from me. 
He was attractive with dark red hair and serious eyes, high cheekbones and a slight curve to his shoulders that suggested muscles and experience. That night, after everyone had eaten dinner and retired to their rooms, he was sitting alone at a table in the bar, something dark and half drunk in his glass. I asked to sit with him tentatively. I was nervous that he would for some reason say no. When he pulled out the chair for me, I noticed that he was reading a book, a new biography of Malcolm X. I had just read a review and tried to impress him with my knowledge. He looked at me interested but nonchalant and asked if I had read the other biography released this year. No, I had to admit, trying not to let my defeat show. He told me he was 33, seven years older than me. I repeated the Elijah Muhammad teaching my father had told me, that the ideal age for a woman should be one half of the man's age plus seven years. He smiled with one side of his mouth and sat forward in his chair. I knew that I had him. He told me that he had left a PhD program in literature a year ago. Global health was his plan B. It wasn't working out so well for him. I'm bored to death, he told me, dropping a heavy palm on the book. Instead of helping people in need, he was managing a bunch of recent college grads. I admitted I was bored too, and we both laughed together. This was the first time I actually saw his face, actually saw him. I imagined him stroking my hair, what it would feel like to look at him across my pillow. We talked excitedly with no breaks in the conversation. I forgot to order a drink, and before I knew it, the time was 3 a.m. We were assigned a site visit together on the other side of town. Afterward, he took me cruising through the streets of Portland. He showed me around downtown and Chinatown and then took me to King, lined with hair salons and corner stores. He pointed out the shabby high school where his father worked as a principal. We ended up on the river near the entrance to the Hawthorne Bridge and watched the expanse slowly lift into the air to allow a boat to pass underneath. He parked in a lot and we sat on the hood, our arms braced over our winter coats. My mind was six moves ahead. I thought of my hands moving through his, air, through his hair, what his breath smelled like up close. He told me that he was moving the following week to a larger apartment with his girlfriend. The words came out coldly and he didn't look at me afterward. We sat for a few more moments outside and then I politely thanked him for the driving tour. We climbed back into his car and he drove me back to the hotel where I barely slept that night, restless in my empty room. The next day, I got on a plane back to the East Coast, exhausted. Afterward, I thought of him often, remembering the warm, excited feeling I felt for those hours I sat in the passenger seat of his car. But I was angry that he had led me on and I didn't reach out to him. Eight months later, he emailed me, saying that he and his girlfriend had finally broken up. He invited me to Portland to stay with him for the weekend, saying he'd pay for the flight. I didn't hesitate much, but I also didn't tell anyone. One afternoon in my senior year of high school, I came home to what I thought was an empty house. I wrestled out of my backpack and jacket, propped my feet up on the couch, and laid my head down. As the day drifted away and I began to sleep, I heard a noise coming from upstairs. It was the familiar sound of a body shifting on a bed, the floorboards complaining underneath then a faint, muffled sniffle. Upstairs, my mother was curled up on her bed, her eyes red. She was still wearing her work outfit, gray blazer, pleated skirt. Her collared shirt was unbuttoned and her stockinged feet poked out from under the covers. She had been in pain for the past two weeks. That morning, she had gone to the doctor to find out the results of her test and had stayed in bed since. The pain had started in her chin, an aching that came out of nowhere and spread to her spine. She had had difficulty giving up, getting out of bed the past few days. She told me how scared she was, and the tears kept coming and coming. I had to ask her to stop, to calm down, and surprisingly, she listened to me, if out of nothing else than desperation. If they don't know what it is, why should you worry, I asked. She smiled at me, my naive logic seeming to calm her. She laughed softly. I kissed her and then excused myself to go downstairs and switched on the television. 
The pain continued and the doctors continued to be confounded. The air at home was decidedly anxious. Our family dinners of curries and aromatic roasts ceased. My father fixed simple utilitarian meals that filled my stomach and suited my mother's health restrictions. I brought a tray to my mother's bedroom every evening and ate at the kitchen table with my father. He fumbled with the dishes and silverware as the sound of the TV buzzed from upstairs. Thank you, my mother would say as she stared at the television. She would hug me or touch my cheek, and I would look deep into her eyes, searching for something that had already gone. At last, a chain of referrals led to an oncologist. I was called to the office at school on the day of the appointment, and I was almost relieved to learn what it was, even though it was the worst possible outcome, because it ended this horrible period of not knowing. He is waiting for me at the airport, carries my small suitcase all the way to his blue hatchback. We kiss in the car, chastely, tentatively. His apartment is on the top floor of a three-story building in King. The landlady is an old Russian woman who smokes at the bottom of the back stairwell and cries every night. She has no family and no visitors. Her life is a mystery that I fill in with tragedy. His apartment is a one-bedroom, spare, decorated with brown thrift store furniture. It smells faintly of mothballs and cologne. In the living room are four towering bookcases. None of them match. The books overflow from the shelves, stacked in corners, piled on the coffee table. We sit in the kitchen and he makes me peppermint tea. When I finish the tea, he takes the cup from me and puts his lips to my forehead. I sigh. We embrace and sink into each other. We find our way to his small bedroom and his low platform bed. He undresses me and runs his fingertips all over my body. When we make love, it's like we are two halves joining. There is no space between us, no awkwardness. We lie in bed for many hours afterwards, smiling, tracing the light from the window on each other's skin. That evening, he takes me shopping at the neighborhood market. It's a pioneering food co-op that also runs a food bank on weekends, serving different income types in the area. We stroll down the aisles. I push the cart from behind and he steers with his hand on the front. He pauses every few steps to hold up an item. You like this? You need this? Do you drink dairy milk? I prefer rice. I say yes to granola, rice milk, a young organic chicken, lemon, fresh rosemary, and baby potatoes. When he goes out for work on my third night, I take the chicken out of the fridge, wash it, and pat it dry. I load it into his only suitable baking pan. My hands shake as I grease the skin with olive oil and rub salt and pepper all over the body. <clears throat> my knife wriggles as I cut the lemon in half and squeeze citrus over the bird. I tear the leaves off the rosemary and dot them all over the skin, shoving the stems deep inside the cavity along with the spent lemon halves. The baby potatoes I run under the tap, trying to be gentle as I massage off the grit under warm water. My mother taught me how to roast a chicken to succulent moistness inside and crispiness outside. She taught me that men don't always need, but they love a woman who can cook and keep house. It wasn't sexism, she said. Such a disavowal, I noted, was usually a signal that it was. Domesticity was harder to find in a partner now because of feminism, she said, and just like a job candidate who can code HTML, it was something that set you above the others. As I lift the chicken covered in foil into the oven, I worried that I have not remembered my mother's instructions correctly. Is it an hour at 350 degrees or 400? Or do I start at 350 and then move up to 400 when I remove the foil? What if the oven is irregular? What if, no matter how perfectly I cook the chicken, he doesn't like it? Then I would be a bad feminist and a bad cook. I shove the bird into the oven and collapse onto the floor. A few hours later, Peter returns home. He sets the table and pours us wine. He eats each bite through a satisfied smile, and I realize that even if the chicken had been charred or half raw, I would never have known the difference from his face. To my taste, it is seasoned well, but a little on the dry side. We spend the next three days in bed, except when we are carousing around the city, hand in hand, feeling like everything is brand new and already ours. On the plane ride home, I look at my calendar, making plans for my next visit. 
When I get home, I make the announcement. I call Amina and my father. It's official, real this time. I'm in love. I don't sleep for two nights. Instead, I am awake and tossing. Each day, I feel less like the person I was the day before, my body hurtling so fast in one direction that my mind cannot keep pace. I can scarcely remember who I was before my body became like this. I dream in bright, swirling colors. The dreams are so vivid that they linger with me long after I've woken up. I feel the same feelings that grip me at night while I'm at my desk or on the subway. I will freeze, lost in them, scared, worried, or comforted in the same way for hours. I dream that I am married to my high school boyfriend, Jerome. We're living in one of the small government tract houses that are, that are on the other side of town. Jerome is his old self, carefree, arrogant, handsome as hell. He doesn't have a job, but he goes out in the morning and doesn't come home until late at night. I question him and find out that he is sleeping with one of the popular girls from our high school, who's living in a mansion on the, on the nicer side of town. She is married to Leonardo DiCaprio, which explains the mansion, but is as unhappy as we are. For most of the dream, I am lonely, and when I find out about the affair, I am livid. I throw a vase at Jerome's head, and it breaks a hole in our living room wall. Jerome is terrified that I will kill him, and I want to. A few days later, in another dream, my mother and father are still living in my childhood home, and I am on the opposite side of town with Peter. We are happy. In this one, I am living with Peter in the same house from my dream with Jerome. My mother shows up to visit, and I am so excited to tell her about my new life. She takes me into a small bedroom at the back of the house, and I expect she will tell me how much she likes Peter and how happy she is for me. Instead, every time I try to speak to her, her image fades like she is appearing on a broken TV screen. Eventually, she fades away completely, and I'm left with nothing but the feeling of losing her all over again. I dream that a hole opens up in the middle of the street, and it swallows my father. He is just walking down the street one day, and then he is gone. I wake up crying, and there is no one for me to cry to. I spend the next few hours huddled in bed, and as soon as day breaks, I call my father. Oma, he says, calling me my nickname, my nickname from childhood. Everything's all right. I'm not going anywhere. It happens again, this tightening feeling and then the nausea, when I am sitting at my desk and then again when I am vacuuming the hallway in my apartment. I realize that the paunch in my belly that normally goes away after a meal doesn't this time. Instead, it is turgid and my pelvis is sore as is slowly being stretched apart and I walk with my hips slightly parted, my tail angled toward the sky. I buy a pregnancy test and it says yes. I'll stop there. Anyone has any questions? Uh, maybe I'll start by sort of situating what I just read in the rest of the book. Um, so what I just read is sort of intertwined a, an introduction of um, the mother character and um, also introducing the reader to the South Africa of Tandi. Um, and at the same time introducing the sort of main love interest and Tandi's pregnancy, which takes up a lot of the novel. And it's through the pregnancy and sort of her reflections on it that get her to, um, that prompt her to think more deeply and to remember her mom. Um, and in the next part of the book, we see um, the mother's disease um, progressing and we eventually see her passing away. And then after that, we see Tandi um, dealing with her feelings of loss that are again triggered um, again by the pregnancy. And so the book kind of weaves back and forth through these narratives. Um, and it was my intention to, um, to link these feelings of loss for her mother with these new unfamiliar feelings of being pregnant and, and anticipating having a child. So that's where I sort of leave you off. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. I'll just start 
Sarah. So you seem so young. Um, how long have you been <laughs> writing? And can you just tell us a little bit about that process for you? Um, I'm much older than I look, but I'll take the compliment. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I consider my path to writing a bit unconventional, although perhaps it's, it's not. Um, I started writing in college. Before that, I was interested in science. Um, and I think that um, that interest and, and that sort of side of um, my, mm, my, it's sort of a way of thinking that's a bit different. Uh, the sort of creative mind and, and the more sort of logical, quantitative mind. Um, but I think that that sort of influenced my writing quite a bit. Um, I think that's part of why I deconstruct the novel in the way that I do. I sort of strip it down to its, um, to its most important parts and put them back together in a way that seems interesting to me. Um, so um, I came to writing somewhat by accident. Um, I entered college. Um, I went to uh, Brown University in Rhode Island, uh, not far away from here. and. Um, when I entered school, uh, my parents were very happy that I was going to be a doctor. And I disappointed them in my first year and told them that was not what I was going to do anymore. Um, and at that point, they had been um, supporting me in um, paying for uh, much of my tuition at that point. And um, as I had disappointed them, they told me that I could no longer take art classes, which had always been my favorite outlet. Um, and sort of in an effort to find a different creative outlet, I, I took a writing class on a whim. Um, it was something that I had, I'd always loved to read and um, had enjoyed writing, but I'd never really done it creatively. And I just sort of went there and um, it, in a way that nothing else in my life really has, aside from maybe some relationships, um, kind of struck me like lightning in the class. Um, and from there, um, you know, uh, any kind of creative pursuit is sort of one part talent, um, probably 10%, but 90% hard work. Um, and I discovered that I had a little bit of talent, but from that point forward, I had to do the hard work part. And um, that was about 15 years ago. And uh, I set about sort of educating myself um, in literature. Uh, I took quite a few writing classes um, and in a very sort of systematic way tried to make myself a writer. Um, and it worked. It doesn't work for everyone, but uh, it worked for me. <laughs> so, yeah. One country in South Africa is uh, the main character. Uh, South Africa? country. Yes, the country South Africa, not Southern Africa. Um, and the book is mostly set in Johannesburg, um, which is towards the north of the country. Um, I think we go to Cape Town a little bit. Um, but Johannesburg is sort of the political center of the country. It's also where my family is from. Um, and in the book, I talk a little bit about what's sort of going on there in the country now, which is a very interesting political situation. Um, but that's, that's primarily where the book's set, around Joe Burke. Yeah. Uh, are you the character of Tandy? Um, interesting question. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, simple answer, no. Um, but the character is heavily inspired by myself, I think. Um, Many people has cl have classified the book as autofiction, um, which is a genre of writing that uses um, uh, basically fiction that is very close to nonfiction in order to reflect on the nature of fiction itself. So if we have a book that appears to be nonfictional in, in many different ways, but it's called fiction, then what is the meaning of each category? And that's an idea that is uh, that was um, very interesting to me at the time that I wrote it. So I guess you could say I wrote this book in this way uh, partly to hear questions like that. Um, uh, but what I hope readers kind of take away from the book, at least one aspect of it, 
um, is to think more, a little bit more deeply about um, where those lines are. Uh, one thing that I noticed when, um, uh, when I was writing the book, and also just in my general reading, is that um, most novels are inspired by the author in some way. If not the uh, main character, there's often subject matter that's very close to their own experience. So one thing um, I often do and that I encourage you to do as well is whenever I read a novel, I read a little bit about the author and there's usually a point in their life and their biography that coincides with that book. It's write what you know, etc. Um, so, um, yeah, it's not exactly, but it's also not, not me. <laughs> Thank you for your reading. Um, looking forward to reading the book. Um, I kind of have a question about the, the first part that you're reading. Um, you're kind of juxtaposing safety um, mm -hmm. in, I'm assuming, the suburbs of Philadelphia versus um, Johannesburg and the, the kind of security that people take for granted in the suburbs um, outside of a city like mm -hmm. Philadelphia. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that kind of Theme runs throughout the novel, mm -hmm. thoughts are on it. Yeah, um, that is, in fact, what I was trying to, to talk about without uh, saying it directly. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is one of those things that was inspired by my life. Um, I grew up going between um, very secure sort of suburban experience and um, going to South Africa once every two years or so um, to visit my family and I've been there countless times. I also started going um, in, you know, when I was an infant, so uh, that was 1985, you do the math. Um, and I basically went continuously from then till uh, the mid to late 90s. And this was a time of, of huge upheaval um, in South Africa. It's also um, the time that, I, that I'm describing in the novel is in the 90s, which, is, um, which was one of the, the highest points for crime in the country. Um, and that experience created a lot of dislocation in my life. Um, I think it uh, really impacted the way I sort of look at the world now. Um, and what I was trying to talk about was um, the feeling of safety, but also the feeling of dislocation that comes from going from one country to another. That is an experience of a lot of people in this country who are immigrants, um, especially people who come from the third world. Um, and it's not just about safety, it's about going back and forth between cultures. There are different sort of norms or different ways of doing things. And as a young person, witnessing that over time is going to put you in a very specific state of mind. Um, and this is also where I'm, I'm sort of working with, with myself as a character. Um, I wanted that experience to be a part of who Tani the narrator was. Um, because she's a person who um, sort of looks at her surroundings and doesn't take it for granted. She's somebody who can um, listen to herself and listen to how she's feeling and think about why she feels the way she does, why people may be treating her differently, um, and why she sort of stands outside of different communities and different people. Um, so that is to say she's a, a thoughtful um, but also anxious kind of narrator. Um, and I wanted that, that quality to come from that experience. That makes sense. Um, uh, so the narrator um, uses her mother, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know I'm, I, I guess I'm just wondering how um, writing about the grief process was for you. Um, I don't know if you had any grief in your life, but um, was it healing to write about grief, or was it did it stir up things for you personally, or? Yeah. Um, this book actually came about um, when uh, my, my mother was sick. Um, 
and I had actually been writing a different novel at that time. It was much more conventional. Um, and uh, I wasn't really connected to that story in a way that you should be to write an entire novel about something. Um, and when I was writing it, I, I was going through this experience of, um, of uh, knowing that I was going to lose my mother very soon. And um, I was also looking after her. And I was taking notes about the experience. And um, because I think that's just how I sort of process difficult things. I research, and it makes me feel better to, to kind of learn all that I can about something. And so I was writing about what was happening and how I was feeling, and I was reading books on grief and illness. Um, and uh, some of these passages started showing up in that other manuscript. Um, and time went on, and my mother passed away, and I came back to the manuscript. And um, those parts of the book, which were very few, only a few pages, um, where I was actually talking about my mother, um, I zeroed in on those. I was told by an outside reader that the, the rest of the manuscript wasn't any good and they were completely right. Um, but these parts were, were something. And um, I think that was when I realized that um, I needed to write about it. I had been avoiding it. It was really difficult to write about. Um, but when I I started, um, when I heard that, I, it sort of uh, gave me permission to write about it. And I started writing this book. Um, and this book brought together both that experience and, and um, a lot of other stories from my life, as a first novel often does. Um, and uh, so I was writing about it in sort of the aftermath of that experience of losing my mother. and. Um, Yes, it, uh, it helped me. It was difficult in the way that, that all writing is. But um, you know, as I said, I think as a writer, um, that's, how I, that's how I live. That's how I, I think through things. And so this book was, was just sort of a, a natural sort of outcome of, of that process and, and how, how, how I process that. My mother died, so that's why. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't have a question, but just a comment that um, you're, you're so rich and so raw in your writing, and it really just resonated with me really deeply with the character development. It was, I plotted through it. I think I read it in a day. Mm -hmm. And kudos, you did beautiful job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just capturing grief and annoying the insecurity that you feel when you're going through something so I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I comment too. I love list, um, listening to you read that about you know, read from the book. It just makes me understand the story at a deeper level. Um, I also have a question. On the technique you used where you're going kind of from thought or time period to another, when you were writing it, did, did you write it first in a chronological order and then reorder it? Or do you write it in a way that just covers a subject you want to cover, whether it's chronological or not? Um. I'm not. I'm not a terribly chronological thinker. I, I'm a bit scatterbrained, and that is just sort of how it, it comes out. Um, not quite in this finished form, but um, <clears throat> what I did. What, what I did was I, as I mentioned, I started with those notes, and I started building the story up around it. Um, it was absolutely not chronological. I. It was sort of like. Um, almost sculpting or filling in the gaps of a story. Um, and when I had finished writing, um, I worked on rearranging it. And um, that was just a process of trial and error of, of moving the different parts around. Um, so it, 
it, it was never a, a chronological story. Um, it seems even more mad the more time goes on the way that I did it. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but no, it was just sort of whatever came to me. And I think probably also because of, because so much of it arose from the experience of loss, which is such a fragmenting experience. It, it sort of breaks up your emotions and your memories. Um, and that was probably also a reason that it came to me in such different sort of chunks. But I, I felt the entire time that I was just sort of doing what I could and then sort of arranged it later into the, the order that you see now. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I think we're going to um, reconvene over at the Woodstock Inn. There's a wine and cheese reception, and Lindsay will be signing copies of her book, and Carrie and Christian will be selling copies. So, thank you so much.